public speaking Takes you to the top, no more dreaming Makes you a world-class speaker This a complete system, ain't nothing easier I used to be shy, never had a clue Welcome everybody to the Communication Lecture Series. I'm your host, Adam Banks. Thank you for listening to another episode. We are back for episode number four of the podcast. Absolutely insane we've made it four episodes. Sorry about the little hiatus that the podcast has been on. Uh, As you know, most faculty uh, is off in the summer. Well, not this guy. I was teaching and uh, trying to stay on top of all of my teaching to make sure that I'm bringing nothing but the best to my students in the classroom. And the best way to do that is to stay relevant and to keep on teaching 12 months out of the year. So I have neglected a lot of the uh, things that I wanted to do for this podcast over the last couple months, and I want to jump back into it. We are now into the fall semester and things are rolling at Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College. And it's so far the semester started off great. We are already in week three of our semester, and things are going good. All right, well, you are tuning in to a very special episode. Well, all the episodes are special, but this one in particular is special because it's so important. This episode, we're going to be talking about communication in the workplace. Communication is your ticket to success. Communication skills is at the top of the list of qualities that most employers desire in their employees. And the good news about communication is that it can be learned. Communication is a skill, which means it can be taught. You can become better at it. What what employers want is professionalism. Looking and sounding professional gains you credibility on the job. Just by the way you dress and the way you sound, the way you present yourself. When you come to work and your clothes are ironed and your clothes are neat and professional and it looks like that you took the time out of your day to dress yourself up for work, you look professional. If you come to work looking sloppy, your clothes are wrinkled, your clothes don't match, it speaks volumes about yourself. Without even saying anything, you're sending a nonverbal message to people that you don't really care and that you're being very unprofessional. If you see two men that are attorneys and attorney A is dressed to the nines, he's got a three-piece suit on, his hair slicked back, his clothes ironed, uh, looks nice. Then you got attorney B who shirt untucked, clothes are wrinkled, clothes doesn't match, very sloppy looking. Just based off appearance, who are you going to pick? Nine times out of ten, people are going to pick attorney A just by how they're dressed. Now, that doesn't mean that attorney A is better than attorney B, but people are going to choose A based off just how they look. So just looking professional can gain you some credibility. Sounding professional gains you credibility. You're going to talk different with your friends than what you would be talking at work. You're going to be talking different in church than what you would be talking like in a bar, or at least I would hope so. You should be talking and your communication should be different when you're at work. You shouldn't be cursing. You shouldn't be telling dirty jokes. You should be sounding professional. You should always be respectful. And remember that you're not the only one at your job. Other people are there too, and you need to be respectful of their space and their time. Remember, we live in a society where there's other people here. See, it's not just you living in this world and and it's your world and we're all living in it. No, it's a society that you need to respect other people. Even sounding different in emails than what you would in a text message gains you credibility. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on in the podcast. So soft skills. Soft skills are career attributes that include the ability to communicate, work well with others, solve problems, make ethical decisions, and appreciate diversity. Sometimes soft skills are the deciding factors for employers. If you got two candidates that match up perfectly, they they both got great degrees, they both have the same amount of experience, they both killed their interview, they, they did awesome, employers need a tiebreaker. 
employers need to pick one. So sometimes the deciding factor between two candidates for a job is the soft skills. And the soft skills is everything that I just mentioned. They want someone who can communicate. They want someone who knows how to communicate with other people. Uh, they want to uh, they want to hire someone who can listen well. And remember, listening is a part of communication. They want someone who can always deliver healthy lines of communication because when poor communication happens, things could go wrong. They want someone who can work well with others. No one wants to work with a fuddy dud. You can have a job shoveling horse manure and absolutely love your job if you work with good people. I've had jobs before. That's not been the best jobs in the world as far as job duties goes, but I love my job because of the people that I work with. And that's really with anything that you do. You could have your dream job and work with bad people, and it's horrible. It's horrible. So employers want to hire someone who can work well with other people. Again, it's not just you living in this world. It's not just you at this workplace. There's other people there too. And employers want someone who can work well with others in a group, in a group setting. What if there's a group project? Well, if you work well with others, you're going to do just fine in that group. Employers want someone who can solve problems, who can make ethical decisions. You are not just representing yourself. When you work for a company, you're also representing that company. I work for a college. Everything that I do, everything that I say reflects on the college that I work for. My social media page, everything that I post, everything that I say, everything that I like, everything that I share reflects on the company that I work for. So employers are going to be looking for someone who can make ethical decisions, someone who does the right thing, someone who is responsible. They don't want to hire someone who has DUIs every weekend going out with their friends or who is posting pictures of themselves uh, half naked on the internet. You wouldn't believe the amount of unprofessionalism I see on the internet from school teachers. And I'm talking middle school teachers who teach little kids. They post on their social media pictures of them half naked. What do the parents think about that? What do the students think about that when they see it? So employers are looking to hire someone who can make ethical decisions and appreciate diversity. It's 2019, folks. And you're going to be working with all kinds of different people, short people, tall people, fat people, skinny people, black people, white people, Chinese people, straight people, gay people, hateful people, nice people. It's going to be diverse. And the older we get and the more time passes, the more diverse companies are going to be. So employers want to hire someone who can appreciate diversity. So soft skills are very important attributes to have. And remember that sometimes the deciding factor in a an employer's decision. Entry-level employees, they're not ready. They're just not. My first job, I had a lot to learn. It was a big learning curve. A lot of times people have a hard time adjusting with their first job because they don't realize the responsibility that a job has. If your job starts at 8 a.m., guess what? You need to be there by at least 8 a.m. Need to be there 10 minutes early, but at least be there by 8 a.m. Don't be there at 8.01. No, your job starts at 8, so be there by 8. If you have a 60-minute lunch break, guess how long you should take for lunch? 60 minutes. You shouldn't take 65 minutes or 70 minutes. You should take what they give you. It's responsibility. You have to show up to work every day. You have to be punctual. You have to be, uh, you have to show up. You can't miss all the time. It's not like you're in school anymore. You're working for a company who relies on you and depends on you. Entry level employees, they're young, straight out of college, some straight out of high school. And it's a learning curve. It takes it takes time to develop soft skills, and it takes time to learn professionalism. Okay, so let's talk about some unprofessional and professional speech habits. Some unprofessional speech habits would be speaking in uptalk, a sing-song speech pattern that has 
a rising inflection making sentences sounds like questions, or using like to fill in mindless chatter, substituting go for said, relying on slang, or letting profanity slip into your conversation. That is unprofessional speech habits in a workplace. But the professional way to do things is to recognize that your credibility can be seriously damaged by sounding uneducated, crude, or adolescent. Let's look at emails. Unprofessional emails. Writing emails that with incomplete sentences, misspelled words, explanation points, instant messaging, slang, and senseless chatting. Sloppy carelessness messages send a nonverbal message that you don't care, you don't know, or you aren't smart enough to know what is correct. Now, as, a, as an instructor, I get emails all the time that irritate me to death. Students will send me an email with no periods, with no uh, paragraph indentions. They have no idea how to spell a word correctly, it seems like. They're writing an email like they're in the second grade, and these are college students that are doing this. All that tells me is that they don't care, or sometimes I question, do they actually know any better? Did their high schools not prepare them? Did their high schools not teach them how to read and write? When you write an email, you need to make sure that your email is written out correctly. You need to write the email and then go back and read it twice to make sure there is no misspelled words, there's no, uh, you, you got your grammar correct, you got your periods where they're supposed to be, you got your spaces where they're supposed to be, and that your email makes sense. Coming from someone who, uh, I'm telling you, coming from someone like myself who gets emails uh, from unprofessional emails from students and other people, because trust me, it's not just students, it's, it's uh, coworkers that can do this as well. When I get an email like that, it lets me, it tells me that they don't care. It tells me that they didn't take the time out to care about me understanding this message. They expected me to dissect and understand everything that were that they were saying. I have gotten emails before. I literally did not know what some of my students were asking. So I would politely write an email back to them and telling them that I do not understand what they are trying to ask me, to please rewrite their email and to proofread their email before they send it to me. It's frustrating. What you need to do is you need to have a subject in your email. Do not write an email with no subject. If it's concerning today's meeting, you could um, your subject could be today's meeting. Employers like to see verbs and punctuation marks. They don't recognize instant messaging abbreviations. Call it crazy, but they value correct spelling, even in brief emails. We do value that kind of stuff. Instant messaging. You should not write an email the way you would text a friend. You don't write out the letter U when you're trying to use the word Y-O-U. You don't send smiley faces and emojis in your emails. That's unprofessional. You need to be professional at all times. Emails like email addresses that you used back in middle school, like too hot to trot or buff guy at aol.com or super snuggly kitty at yahoo.com or hot babe at hotmail.com is not an acceptable email address. Imagine having that on your resume. Imagine I had a fraternity brother. His email all the way up to college was lieutenant poop at hotmail.com. How unprofe- as funny as that is, how unprofessional would that be? Uh, imagine writing your email, an email to your boss saying that you're not going to be able to make it into work that day. And in his inbox pops up Lieutenant Poop at Hotmail.com. That kills your credibility. He's not going to take you serious, and it looks very unprofessional. An email address should, be, should include your name or a relevant, positive, business-like expression. It should not sound cute or like a chat room nickname. Same with your voicemail. An, an outgoing message with uh, sh- you know, loud background music, weird sounds, or a joke message is not appropriate. You know those voicemails when you call someone and they'll say, Hello? Hello? Hey, what's up? I'm good. How are you? 
And then you're on the other line talking to them because you think that they're on the other line. And then all of a sudden, the voicemail cuts you off and says, ha ha, I'm just kidding. I'm not here. But I fooled you though. Leave a message at the beep. And then you're leaving a voicemail and you're so frustrated because you've been had by your friend. Imagine someone was calling to offer you a position for a job or someone was calling you to invite you in for an interview. They're, they might be so mad over your voicemail, they say, you know what, forget it. This guy's still, he's, he's still a kid. He still thinks he's in high school. And they're going to say the heck with you, hang up the phone, and you're not going to hear from him again. Your voicemail just needs to be short and simple. If you call my phone right now, my voicemail would pick up. It would say, hello, this is Adam Banks. I'm sorry I missed your call. Please leave a message. If someone calls you, if an employer calls you and you're expecting a very important phone call, you need to make sure that you are in a position to where you can answer that phone call in a professional setting. Don't answer the phone if you've got a lot going on at the moment. If you got a soap opera playing in the background or a loud movie going on in the background or you got kids crying in the background or you're in a club and the music's just blaring, if you can't answer and you're not in a quiet environment, it is better to let that phone call go to voicemail, mind you, a professional voicemail, and then when you get to a point to where you can talk in a quiet professional environment, that's when you call them back. They're not going to penalize you for not answering the phone. So most of the time they're expecting to get your voicemail. So if you cannot talk professionally right at that second they're calling you, do not answer the phone. But people will, buddy. People will call, People will answer their phone. It don't matter what is going on in their house, what's going on in their apartment, what's going on. Uh, they'll answer it in the middle of Walmart with a bunch of kids crying, sirens going off, people screaming over the intercom, and they'll try to have a conversation with you. It's rude to the other person on the other, on the other line. So you need to make sure that you're in a professional environment to take that phone call, quiet environment. And this seems like common sense, but it's, uh, people are still doing it, so I want to mention it. You want to make sure that you're professional with your cell phones and uh, your, you know, your smartphone devices. Taking or placing calls during business meetings or during conversations with fellow employees is unacceptable. Since when did the phone get first priority? You're talking to someone and your phone rings and they pick it up while they're talking to you and they answer it? Since when did the phone get first priority? When did that person calling you get first priority? No, the person who gets first priority needs to be the person present, person right in front of your face. If you're talking to someone at work, you do not need to answer your phone if it goes off. You don't even really need to send somebody a message while they're standing there talking to you. Because it looks like that you're not paying attention and you don't care what they're saying. If you're in a meeting and your phone goes off, you need to take that phone call outside or you need to wait till the meeting is over. Do not answer it during the meeting. Or if you're in a presentation and you need to take a, an, a, an important phone call, take it outside. But if you're not expecting anything, any calls or anything like that, it's just better to turn your cell phone off. If anything... Just silence it or put it on vibrate. Nonverbal communication happens all the time in the workplace. Remember, 93% of our communication is nonverbal because we're constantly moving. We're not constantly talking, but we're constantly moving, which sends silent nonverbal messages. Understanding a message is more than listening to words. Nonverbal communication includes all unwritten and unspoken messages, whether intended or not. You can say something verbally, and your nonverbal says something completely different. If I walk into the room and I say, Guys, it's so happy to see you today. I am very happy to be here. You're going to look at me and you're going to be like, Okay. Yeah, right. Because my nonverbal is very sluggish. I'm looking down to the ground. And I'm verbally saying that I'm happy to see you, but it, my body language is saying something different. 
So when verbal and nonverbal messages clash, listeners tend to believe the nonverbal. The listeners are going to look at me and say, okay, I don't believe him. It's like in a relationship. When you ask your significant other, hey, are you mad? And they look at you and say, no, I'm not mad. But you can tell by their body language that they are, or their body language is saying that they are, something's wrong. You're going to believe the nonverbal before you would believe the verbal. Silent messages. Your body sends silent messages. Eye contact. It lets people know that you're paying attention. Facial expressions. Postures and gestures. Time. How you spend your time sends a message. The space that you, that you have. How you keep your area. Is it clean? Is it messy? Is it organized? A territory sends a silent message. We're all very territorial as people. I bet when you go into a classroom, you sit in the same seat every time you're in that class. I bet when you pull into a parking lot, you tend to go over the same parking spot that you go to every time. It's because we're territorial people and your personal appearance. But we talked about that a little bit earlier in the podcast. But you need to build strong nonverbal skills. Establish good eye contact. Use posture to show your interest. Improve your decoding skills, meaning your listening skills, which we talked about earlier. Avoid assigning nonverbal meanings out of context because you want those nonverbal and verbal messages to match up. And if you don't know how to do this, just watch other people. Learn from other people. Learn from the professional people that you have around you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for listening to another episode of the Communication Lecture Series. I hope you really enjoyed the topic of communication in the workplace, something that everyone needs to listen to. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for making this such a great podcast. Keep listening. I'll catch you in the next episode of the Communication Lecture Series. I'm Adam Banks, and I'll see you next time.